<laughs> All right, well, it is 12 o'clock on the dot. So uh, welcome everyone to the fourth in a series of 101 open stories as part of Year of Open uh, with the great support of our partner, the OE Consortium. My name is Jenny Heyman, and I am a proud member of the GoGN Graduate Network and working with a small team on this 101 Open Stories project uh, and really have had so much fun this week hearing people's stories about more or less how the heck did you come to be an open advocate? <laughs> what was your path to this? Um, and so our, I would like to start alphabetically with introductions uh, with our guests. Um, Terry Green is joining us, but seems to be offline at the moment. Hopefully he'll be back soon. But we'll start with Helen, just a quick introduction. Hi, I'm Helen DeWard. I teach the Faculty of Education here in Central Ontario. And my focus, passion is, is storytelling, digital storytelling, and media production. So I'm really happy to be able to share some stories today. All right, great, super. And Christina Hendricks from out in BC. Yes, I'm Christina Hendricks. I teach philosophy at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Um, so I'm on the West Coast. Uh, and the other thing that I do these days, I just got appointed as the Deputy Academic Director for the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology. That's a mouthful <laughs> at the University of British Columbia. So um, right, yeah, great. my work in Open, I think, will connect with that. Thanks, Christina. And David, let's go with you. Hi, I'm David Porter. I'm a CEO at eCampus Ontario, uh, originally from British Columbia and in British Columbia this morning uh, on vacation, but um, heading back to Ontario next week. Uh, and hopefully Terry Green will be joining us. Uh, I think his internet is a little kind of challenging this morning, but um, he's at Fleming College and I'll get him to introduce himself when he starts storytelling perhaps. So maybe we'll start with you, Helen, and if you just wanna start sharing your story with us, that would be great. So this was a particular challenge for me when you first invited me to, to kind of talk about how I became an open educator. I, 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 I ended up going down this rabbit hole of reflection for a while. And ultimately, when I ask my students to tell their stories and come up with their stories, they find it really challenging to figure out where the beginning, the middle, and the end might be, um, how to craft it into a, a narrative that makes sense for themselves. So that's what I was trying to do. And I realized that there is no beginning or ending with this open education story for me. Um, I was born and raised on a farm. so. For me, it's, it really started with, you know, being part of that, that open culture, you know, living in the open, growing things in the open, the seasons mattered, um, uh, time to just get out and play with my siblings, um, you know, that I called it imagineering, um, that sense of exploration and tinkering and playing in the open ultimately comes from the, that, that deep roots of, uh, of being a farm girl. Um, becoming um, a teacher, uh, prim uh, my background is a pr as a primary teacher, um, and then moved into um, school leadership administration, and then took the step into teaching in the higher ed in the Faculty of Education. Um, I think back on kind of the way I started teaching really was in an open in an open way. It was the like the early onset of computers in the classroom, the early onset of um, inter internet access. <laughs> and I really um, connected to Penny's conversation yesterday about, you know, the dial up squeal and, and finding yourself on the internet and talking to people you've never talked to before. So uh, ultimately, it was another step towards open for me. Um, and then you know, with the, that increase of, of um, com computers in the classroom really me meant that I looked for ways to open the classroom doors and windows for the students that I was teaching, particularly the exceptional learners, those who were disenfranchised, those who were marginalized, those who, who had doors closed to them a lot of time, and really finding ways for them to connect and, and have conversations with people that mattered in their lives, um, and using the internet and using um, publish publishing um, beyond just the, the classroom material and you're not publishing for me you're publishing for somebody else so uh, again another little step to that that whole um you say open access education that martin weller talked about um, and then 
I have to say the next step was my, uh, my mountain climbing. Um, I've climbed the one mountain. If you look at pictures of Machu Picchu and you see the mountain behind, that's always in every picture. I've climbed that mountain twice, but I connected it to, I've, I've, I've gained um, educational experience twice by doing two master's programs. And the second master's program kind of was on the groundwork based on the, the groundwork of the first um, master's that I did. And the master's of ed tech at, um, from UBC really was the catalyst for what I'm now doing as an open educator. Um, it pushed and, and coerced me. Um, I gained confidence. Um, we talk, uh, my final project was called My Renovations. And, and because I was doing renovations in real life, it became my renovation, how I became renovated by doing the, you know, doing the coursework and the, the content and the activities through the MET program. And then I started pushing myself even further because I started teaching at the university faculty of education and I wanted to, sh to, to model and share and, um, be an advocate for my own students. So the more I wanted to teach about open and to have them become open educators, I had to model it, so I had to step out. So I started blogging more regularly, frequently. And I think uh, um, I, I really like the, the connections that a few other people made about that one moment when somebody paid attention to what they were talking about. And for me, it, it was Alan Levine who responded to a blog post I did um, entitled Me in Media. And I was really struggling with this notion of who I was in, in open digital spaces. So he responded with a whole, <laughs> his comment is a blog post in itself. And at the time I was using Alan's um, DS106 and, and, and you know um, all that open stuff that he was doing. And Alan Levine, oh my God, Alan Levine commented on my blog post. So it's that, that same experience that a few others have talked about, you know, their, their go-to person or somebody that really paid attention to. So I'm, I'm really conscious of doing that now for, for my teacher candidates, for people that I see are new to open spaces, I'm making a point of responding to them in some way and, and encouraging that, that affirmation and encouragement. Um, that we, we need to take the, the next steps and be comfortable where we are. So when I started teaching at the faculty, I made a commitment intentionally to put my coursework in the open. Um, I dual layer all the courses that I teach and they're, they're within the learning management system. Um, so the students who are, are not comfortable in the open have a, have a place to, and a, a way to share and connect. And then those who are ready to go to the open, the open space is there. So each of the courses are dual layered. Um, all the courses are on open websites. And the, courses, and the courses iterate and change as I teach the courses each year. So the pages change. So I tell my students, yes, you can come back and find whatever you want or, or all, all the stuff is still there, but it may not be exactly the same. You know, the content will necessarily change. I've revamped uh, the initial course that I did was digital teaching and learning. It's been revamped. Um, I, I moved it from a WordPress to a Weebly site. I'm now doing an online course called Critical Digital Literacy that is, again, web-based, but I also have the back-end um, secure space in learning management, and they really mirror each other. So I've, I've, I've iterated the course designs as I go. But when I finished the MET program and I graduated, I, I started looking for what next. And that's when I <laughs> call it my year of MOOC. I became MOOCified. I went and MOOCed all over the place. Uh, the RISO, um, Digital Pedagogy MOOC MOOC, um, CL MOOC, uh, Human MOOC, uh, and then the Design Thinking MOOC. So there were a whole pile of different kind of experiences for open learning. And that's how I got connected to Creative Commons and to Virtually Connecting. So those are the communities, uh, spaces that I continue to share and, and collaborate in. 
And then this year, it's nice to see um, becoming part of the OEO Rangers uh, group that I think is going to um, kind of open things in Ontario. So it's a, you know, a core group of people who will celebrate, um, advocate, um, model, share in open spaces. And I'm really excited to be part of that. Network, communication, collaboration, all those, those really neat things that we want for ourselves and, and for our students. So when I was preparing for today, this, this story, um, I went to um, Martin Weller's book, uh, Battle for Open, and chapter two really just jumped out at me. So I, I started just thinking, what are my motivations for open? And ultimately, it's not necessarily for me, but for my students. Um, and modeling and being able to risk uh, and to jump into open spaces and look at um, what it'll mean for them in terms of their professional practice. Yeah, as, as teachers in the world today, they, they really do need to be connected. They do need to be um, collaborating. They do need to um, be engaged in inquiry in their professional practice and that doesn't end when they leave my classroom or, or graduate to go into the field so that this is the, this is kind of like their sandbox space for me so that's why I do it um, so that they can see the risks and rewards gain professional identity um, understand um, copyright and uh, the student safety and security um, those types of things. So my my story is doesn't have a beginning or an end. Um, obviously, it's it's an ongoing story. It's not necessarily the never ending story, but uh, as I say, there's always another mountain to climb, and um, I'm I'm sure that there are people that I'm I'm going to be climbing with. <laughs> <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you so much, Helen. <laughs> So just to confirm, Helen, your students are, are Ontario teacher in pre-service teachers. Is that correct? So they're going to teach in the PK-12 system here in Ontario, likely? Yes. Yes. So they're pre-service. Uh, it's, it's now a two-year program. Um, the courses I teach are elective courses or concurrent ed courses. Um, and you can find them. I'll put the blog link in and, and you can link to the course content. Um, don't bet that it's <laughs> who was it? Peter was saying no, it was uh, somebody was saying that um, OER goes to repository to die. Um, I think it was Nicola Pallas. Nicola. <laughs> <laughs> that case. Yeah, we don't want that to happen. No. These are recreated each year, and in, in, in yeah, so the pre-service teachers. Lovely. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, Terry, we're going to surprise you by by asking you to go next alphabetically, and uh, we're sorry we missed you in the round of introductions, but um, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Terry Green. I'm a learning technology specialist at. Fleming College, which has campuses in Junior Nails. This is Alice, by the way. Say hi. Um, uh, Fleming College has campuses in Peterborough, Lindsay, Halliburton, and a small one in Coburg in Ontario. And uh, okay, so my story. <clears throat> I, uh, I took a, well, okay, well, I have a Bachelor of Education in Elementary Ed from the University of Alberta. Um, and then I, doing that made me realize that I love to to educate and teach, but I wasn't um, what the the little kids wasn't teaching kids wasn't what I wanted to do. I realized in the end, so I moved on to I moved out to Toronto and I took a um, uh, uh, teaching certificate, uh, ESL teaching certificate, grad certificate at George Brown College, and I started to teach. Um, at George Brown after I finished, and I really enjoyed teaching adults. Um, but I was still wanting to um, continue my education. Ah! <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so I was still looking for what did I want to, to learn in my own career, educational career path. And I didn't know what instructional design was until I saw an ad for a program in instructional design at the University of North Dakota. Um, <laughs> I see that. Um, 
and it was fully online so I could continue to, it was online, but live online. Um, and it started in the evening so I could continue to work as a teacher um, or whatever I was doing at the time and go to school at night or yeah, take the class at night. Sorry, I'm getting lost to where I'm talking about here. Um, anyway, so it was live online. It wasn't open yet. I didn't know anything about open yet, but I started a master's degree in about 2009 in instructional design and technology because I really enjoy the creating of um, educational spaces and things and stuff. Um, and in that program, I never, nobody ever mentioned open or anything, but Can you hear me? Hi, Terry. Yep. Hi. Uh, what was the last thing I, that you heard me say? <laughs> Something about ed tech, <laughs> masters. <laughs> okay. So I was working on a, a master's of instructional design. Um, nobody at the University of North Dakota. Um, no, no talk about open yet, but um, they were great at building learning community in all their courses. And they always talked about it. This is very important. Build a community. And I really... That was one of the huge things I took away from, from the program was that there's so much benefit to thinking about and crafting community in your, in your um, courses and programs. So that was a big takeaway. So after that um, degree, I was started looking for uh, work in the field, and I was lucky enough to land the job at Fleming College. And we started to, I started to work there. Um, and doing that and then ultimately after a few years this is i'm getting to the open part now um can you hear me now still yeah it's a little freezy now and again but it's okay so far terry i think i'm low come on internet Hmm. Hello. Ah, hear. hi, Terry. Back again. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'll, I'll wrap this up as quick as I can. Uh, okay. So one, I have a blog post that describes this entire story, just so you know. Great. On my, my post uh, on my domain called learningnuggets.ca, and I think you'll share that. Um, so it's all there. Great. I'm just telling me it's unstable. Can you hear me right now? Yep. Maybe try without the video, Terry, and see if just the audio is okay. uh, easier on your internet. You know what I mean? Yeah. Stop video. Okay, I stopped the video, but can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, so when I get cut off again, just so you know, learningnuggets.ca has a blog post which tells this exact story. Uh, it's called, my post is called Things Open, because you asked me to describe how we got into Things Open. So one day I'm asked to go to my boss's office and talk about my performance review. And she asked me to uh, find something. <laughs> uh, what do you want to do for professional development? And I had looked around and found, as has been mentioned a few times, uh, DS106. Uh -huh. I didn't, wasn't looking for anything open or I was just looking for kind of free online. And it fit really well because it. I figured I could learn a whole bunch of stuff about how to brush up on my digital skills in whatever area um, so I it looked cool <laughs> so I, I I suggested it to my boss and she said go ahead and try it and I didn't really know what it was about it that I thought was so uh, interesting until later and now I realize it's because 
on the site, you don't just see what um, they say you should do. You see the work of the participants everywhere. That's so I'm like, I can see what other people are going to do with these instructions. I can see, I can take their ideas and run with them in my own direction. I might be able to see my own stuff up there. It was so cool and motivating. I could even suggest new activities. Um, I can be a fundamental piece of this whole thing. That's so motivating and so uh, inspiring. And I've kind of just run from there uh, with all their ideas <laughs> in everything I do. Um, so from there uh, and through the people that are participating in DS106 is, has brought me to, um, first of all, just basically develop an awesome uh, network of, uh, of people, a professional learning network on Twitter. I could ask Helen, you mentioned Alan Levine, I, like all these open superheroes that I can tweet, ask questions and get their, their ideas immediately anywhere in the world is like, I don't know how we put a price on that. That's amazing. Um, I, I can't remember specifically what brought me to from through this to uh, virtually connecting. Um, I know it's probably Helen somehow. I don't know how we connected Helen, but um, through you, I came to virtually connecting and that's just like the DS106, this great uh, platform to, to connect with open thinkers around the world. Um, that It overlaps big time with DS106, the, the people involved. And, but I can get to be involved with all these uh, conferences that I around the world that I otherwise had no idea about or be involved with. Um, last year, I was able to go to the Open Education Conference in uh, Virginia. Uh, this year, I won't be able to make it, but I know I'll be able to do virtually connecting and feel um, like a big part of it regardless, even if I'm not leaving our, my hometown to, to go. Um, so virtually connect, like DS106 brought me to that. Let me figure out, I'm just checking my blog post to see where I am in my story. Oh, that's the other thing uh, I learned through, through that. Like, like Helen mentioned, the, the blogging for yourself, uh, which I only started because DS106 told me to. Um, but from there, it's, it's so um, enriching of your professional life to, to take what you're doing in your day-to-day -day job and write about it and you reflect on it and it makes you think hard about your process and reflect on how you do things differently the next time and um, yeah, do it because I'm told to. Um, and it's so, um, you know, it, built, it plays on your, your ego in a, a good way, I think, that you put your stuff out there and you see people seeing your stuff and reading it and, and connecting to it. It feels great. And also, you know, if you're if you are doing it, you might uh, inspire other people to do it, and you might get to see their ideas, and it, it kind of rises the tide for everybody, I think. Um, and another kind of great benefit of of the e easing your way into open is that you get to to take before you give. You can go and see what's out there in open, and you can take and take and take, and um, eventually you and it'll help you build the confidence that what you have is is worth giving to um it's kind of like growing up you get birthday presents you get christmas presents you get presents given 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 but eventually you start to to give back yourself uh, you can do that with open um so i kind of like that you're always gonna be able to take more than you give because there's so much great stuff out there um and also that in all that and I, I don't like same with virtually connecting I can't remember where I got keyed into um, Creative Commons um, it's all just part of, uh, of the whole big puzzle but that's been so nice too to um, be able to contribute to something and and take from it as well and so 
anyway, Creative Commons, another big, lovely piece of the puzzle. Um, what else is open? Oh, I'm one of how many, David? 100 open, open Ontario Open Education Rangers. How many yes. of us are there? Uh, I would say actually maybe about 80 right at the moment, Terry. We're always looking for more. <laughs> and I forgot to mention in my introduction that. Okay, I'm still waiting for <laughs> yeah. my. Right. I'm waiting for my mule or my horse to show up for, so I can. <laughs> So there's three three of us here. Jenny, do you count as an open ranger? Uh, I do. It's possible um, that I've been assigned to be the sheriff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been deputizing. I just deputize people into the movement wherever. I don't know if I'm allowed to, but oh, might yeah. as well. <laughs> you bet. Um, which is it's just fun to be a part of that community. Like back to my. Um, yeah, back to my master's degree where, where they talked about uh, community so much. It's like open is the key to community building and, and even culture building of, of just this uh, great spin sharing life. It's, it's, it's great. Um, so one other little silly thing that... Uh, has come to me through open is uh, I am the unofficial uh, hander outer of crap badges, which are poorly drawn, uh, low, low, low production value, personal created badges for people, usually through Twitter that I hand out um, just based on random acts of awesomeness. Um, so, it's kind of my little thing is is when I see someone do something kind of neat, I use the snipping tool. I snip a piece of my screen that's just bare and draw a terribly drawn badge and tweet it to them, and um, and they seem to like them. And it started after visiting the Open Education Conference in Richmond last year. My reflective blog post that I made uh, when I got home. I handed out a um, a badge to uh, one of the presenters I had seen there because uh, and he <laughs> it was called the f bomb badge because he dropped the f word in the middle of a of a pr presentation and this guy was a student I, I admired his moxie and just the delivery of the f word in a in a professional presentation was. Uh, just made me laugh so hard. So I gave him the F bomb badge, and I used a really poorly drawn my my very poor skills. Not even as high tech as MS Paint. I used the snipping tool, and from there I've been the hander outer of crap badges, and that's kind of my my fun thing that I like to do through open education. Um, but but other than that, like our every oh. I'm forgetting one huge piece of the puzzle is that um, from the Open Ed Conference, I was uh, inspired by Robin DeRosa and her, um, her, her co-creation of a textbook with her students to do that for Open Ed, higher ed pedagogy. So it's called the, <laughs> it's called the, open, uh, the open Faculty Patchbook. And two people on this panel here have written patches. Um, half of them are about half are by Fleming College faculty and even a technologist. And the other half are from Egypt, Maha and a bunch of her colleagues and a few in, um, in the States and over Ontario, we've created a, uh, a, a kind of informal how to teach in higher ed textbook written by uh, by each other for each other and it's about to be um, published into a paper copy that we will uh, send to everybody who wrote one and have a few extra hand to hand out and we're definitely handing them out to our new faculty starting in the fall to say hey we here we wrote we wrote a textbook for you on, about how to do this and uh, it's going to be an ongoing project uh, new patches can pop up any day on the, on the WordPress site but then we move them into a press book on, on a regular basis into publishing them into book books or manuals, um, which has been a pretty 
pretty awesome project. The the last one that came out was especially great by Chuck Pearson. It had um, it's had seven hundred, eight hundred hits because it's such a great um, uh, it's such a great description of how to have empathy in your teaching. Uh, if you haven't read it, go have a look. It's called Just Listen on the Open Faculty Patch Book. I'll I'll share the uh, the list and and Helen's is fantastic and and Jenny's is fantastic. They're all so great and they're all so different looks at at how to teach and it's if it wasn't for um, the the kind of tenets of open education, it, this this resource wouldn't exist for for all of us and I think it's going to be a great resource moving forward. And I think that might be plenty of story for me. That's uh, that's a really I great. I hope you've round. been able to hear me. <laughs> yep. Yeah, the audio is perfect, Terry. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm glad, very glad, that you remembered about the faculty patch book because it's really a beautiful project. Um, and also, you know, I think creativity is, seems to be a huge driver for you, and I'm I deeply Thank appreciate you. that in you know your spirit of just go out there and try it and draw any way you can. Um, so thank you for sharing your story. And we're going to move on to Christina next. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I've connected with all of you in one way or another through my open work. Um, and so I'm just going to try to hit some of the highlights because uh, somebody had said in the, in the chat that they had, well, Terry had, had blogged about it and Helen had blogged about it. And I thought, oh, that's such a great idea. I should write a blog post about my story about how I got into all this because I don't know, it might be interesting to some people. And if nothing else, it'll help me remember forever. So I did take some notes, but they're not in a nice blog post yet. So, um, so like I said, I'm at UBC in, in Vancouver and I didn't know anything about open until I got here. So I got here in 2004. Um, and before that, you know, I just was teaching philosophy in a sort of, you know, way that I was taught, which is just in a regular closed kind of course. Um, and when I got here, I don't know, around the mid 2000s after, you know, maybe 2005, 2006, um, Brian Lamb was teaching uh, at the, the Center for Teaching and Learning here. And he's the one who got me into or helped me understand uh, Creative Commons licenses and wikis and blogs. So he did a number of workshops here on all of those things. And so it was really around 2005, 2006 that I started getting into to open to some degree. And I started a blog in 2006. I had to go back and look at my very first blog post and it was 2006. Um, so that's a little tiny step you know, for anybody to listen, but it was great as a reflective piece. Um, and then I think things didn't really take off for me with open until I had my year of mooking, which was <laughs> like Helen did. Uh, mine was in 2013. I was on I've tried to do MOOC since then in the middle of my, you know, job and I don't do a very good job of it, but when I was on sabbatical, I really got into uh, uh, doing a few of them. My first one was ET MOOC or Educated People, and, and I do not remember them all. And, and I'm kind of like Terry, where I know a whole bunch of people now in the open movement, and I don't remember how I connected with them. And many of them were through at MOOC or ET MOOC, uh, but I just don't remember who was with what. But I know that Alec Kuros was a, a big part of EdMOOC, um, and Ellen Levine was also a uh, part of that as well. So he's, his name comes up quite a bit. Uh, I took that in January 2013 to March. Then I sort of had this, in that, we had a whole section on open education. So it, it was a MOOC that had different kinds of themes around uh, educational technology, and, and one of them was open education. I think Audrey Waters was speaking during that one as well. And it just kind of sparked something in me. I thought, oh, right, yeah, I'd kind of forgotten about, you know, Creative Commons and wikis and blogs. I mean, I'm blogging, but something just kind of fit to me with, with the idea of being open as an educator. So right after that, Martin Weller at the Open University in uh, the UK was offering a, a course on open education. It was through the Open University, so it had 
OU students, but it was also open to anybody else. So I was moving through that along with, with people who were officially registered in the course. So that one was all about open education. I took that and I learned all, quite a bit more there and connected with some more people. Again, I can't remember who all was in that and who was elsewhere. And then, you know, you're gonna hear the same story, I suppose, from a lot of people in the open education movement. Uh, then I took DS106, <laughs> which Digital Storytelling 106 is kind of all about um, using uh, uh, digital technologies, using films, uh, videos, images, drawing, uh, to tell stories, basically. Um, and Jim Groom was running that version. Uh, Alan Levine was a big part of that as well. And I met quite a few people through that. I then connected with Creative Commons to some degree through what was then called, and I'm not sure it still exists in this guise, uh, Peer to Peer University. So Peer to Peer University was a, a sort of platform for people to put on their own open courses. And Creative Commons had what they called the School of Open at Peer to Peer University. Um, so I worked with them, a few people in Creative Commons and uh, somebody else who wasn't part of Creative Commons, but just like me kind of interested. We put together an open online course called Why Open, which ran in 2014 and 2015 during the summer. So through these early kinds of things, I just made I guess this is kind of the key. You just connect with people in the open education movement and then things sort of start to take off, right? You can do it through taking open online courses. You can do it through, um, well, virtually connecting, which I just recently got connected to, which is uh, a group of people who find ways for those who can't attend conferences to attend them virtually. I mean, you're not always able to actually attend the sessions, but you're able to connect with people who are at the conference and talking about what's going on at the conference. And that's huge. Um, it doesn't feel exactly like you're there, but the thing for me that's most useful about it is you get to find out what, you know, kind of the talk is or what the new projects are that are happening at the conference. But maybe probably even more valuable than that to me is connecting with people. So I've met quite a few people through virtually connecting that I wouldn't have otherwise. So to me, I mean, if you want to get into, you know, open education, if you want to kind of do more uh, and involve yourself in more projects, um, find a way to connect with people around the world virtually um, through virtually connecting or otherwise. Twitter has been really huge for me as well. There's a big open education um, network on Twitter that you can you can link up to and and uh, what I did is I just found people that I, I had shared interest with and I saw who they were following or who was following them, you know, and then you kind of snowball out. So that worked really well. Okay, so that's kind of the, the beginning. Um, what I do now uh, at my own university is uh, in my classes. So I teach philosophy and kind of like Helen, um, I've got the open layer of my courses. My courses are on a WordPress site. Each of them have their own WordPress site. And then there's also a little bit that's, that's on the closed LMS in case uh, students want to do that. Although I, I have very little on the closed LMS. Um, if they don't want to put anything publicly on our course website, then they just submit it to me separately or, you know. Um, I share most of my teaching resources openly with a Creative Commons license, uh, almost everything except for my exams, because you know, sometimes I want to reuse those. Um, I, I do a number of videos for my courses, uh, so those are up all up on YouTube. Um, and then, so that's teaching. Uh, at my university, I kind of became, partly because I was blogging, literally because I was blogging about all this stuff, I became sort of one of the, the main open faculty at the university because I was out there, right? They knew what I was doing. So I got invited to do presentations and workshops. Um, I got invited to join this, uh, what we call our open pack, which is a group of people at our university that includes students, faculty, uh, staff from the Teaching and Learning Center and librarians. Um, and we get together once a month and we work on open stuff at the university. We put together a website, we talk about events, we think about what kinds of awareness raising we need to do, advocacy. So that's, that has been a fantastic group. I highly recommend working with students 
the students at UBC, and I'm sure it's true in a lot of places, have gotten so much more done than we would have been able to do on our own through the student government. They have a big voice. So work with students. <laughs> um, and now I'm, I'm Deputy Academic Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I just started in this position, so I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I will continue working on open issues in, at the university through that and maybe have even a bigger voice uh, based on that, which could be useful. Um, what am I doing now? I'm working on, um, well, quite a few things, but one big thing is an open textbook project. So I'm working with the Rebus Foundation, uh, which is a, a new foundation run by um, a, a few people, but that includes Hugh McGuire from Pressbooks. They've gotten some grant money to work on open textbooks, um, and it's been really great so far. So it's an open textbook in the intro, in Introduction to Philosophy, and it's a huge project because we're collecting people from all around the world to each write a small section that's going to become this really big open textbook. We have part editors for each different part of the textbook and each part editor is collecting authors and I'm kind of the main editor. Um, we're, just, we're just at the early stages, but uh, this is really exciting. So hopefully that will come out you know, within our lifetimes. No, hopefully very soon. Um, and I'm also highly connected with virtually connecting too. So uh, I will be at the Digital Pedagogy Lab Institute in Vancouver starting tomorrow. We are virtually connecting from there. If anybody wants to uh, connect with us, you can go to uh, virtually connecting website um, and uh, find out how to do that. We were also asked to think about the things that were interesting or surprising or frustrating or um, and, and I just have a couple of minutes, so I'll just say a couple of things. Uh, the interesting, maybe surprising, but also frustrating <laughs> things in my work as, as somebody who's trying to advocate or raise awareness about open is, is the resistance that I'm seeing in, in people to adopting um, open uh, educational resources. And I think, I mean, a lot of it is lack of time and that I understand. Okay, it's, it's hard to find the time to revamp a course to, you know, to, to do new materials and things like that. So that I completely understand. But there's, there's also some resistance that I don't quite understand, which is that they must be lower quality, right, than, than publisher materials. And, and I honestly don't get it because even with publisher materials as a teacher, I read through it, you know, I don't just... I don't just assign it because a publisher made it, right? A, a you know, big publisher made it. I, I read through it to make sure it's good quality, right? Um, so you would do the same thing with OER, right? with, let's say with an open textbook or any other open uh, educational resources. Uh, maybe sometimes it's because they know the person who wrote the, the, the material or something like that. But, you know, open materials often have good, um, reviews, right? They'll have reviews, peer reviews by people who teach. Uh, and then you read through it yourself and you decide if it's any good. So yeah, I guess I've been a little bit frustrated and somewhat surprised by the resistance to adopting open educational materials beyond simply, you know, the real problem of, of not having enough time <laughs> to revamp a course related to that. And then also the resistance to sharing your own materials. And that one, I, I really want to try to dig into that question more. Um, I've done some research on open textbooks. I've published a couple of things on open textbooks and other open educational resources and, and how students feel about them and, and how faculty who've used them feel about them. And they're quite positive. Um, and I, next, I'm, I'm hoping at some point to do some research on the, the barriers that, that faculty have to sharing their own teaching resources, because I'm curious what those are. Um, obviously, I do a lot, so I don't have very many, but um, I'm curious, you know, I find it interesting and want to know more about, about why others don't. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. All right, thank you so much, Christina. I'm so glad you're part of the community. It's, it's such a nice connection, um, peer to peer, educator to educator, to hear what's going on among educators. Um, uh, as part of my work for eCampus Ontario, that's like gold for me to, to understand those perspectives better so that I can support and, and keep the open invitation 
um, useful for educators. Yes. So yeah, yeah. thanks for all your on. work and thank you for your story. And uh, we'll move on to David now. Hi, uh, thanks for having me today to this uh, little storytelling session. My story, of course, is much, goes back a lot further. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I actually started in K-12 education and worked at Simon Fraser University in the 90s in teacher education, working with faculty and faculty associates and supervising the whole sort of rethinking of the teaching process that was happening in British Columbia at the time. And my role there was really to bring uh, a technology theme to education and teacher education. And so we equipped students with really rudimentary laptops and uh, ear coupled modems and all kinds of really great gear uh, way back in the 80s, late 80s and early 90s. Um, that worked out really well. I ran a, a network called SFU Exchange then that brought experts like lawyers and, and people who knew about science uh, into the uh, open and into the sort of uh, digisphere where people could ask them questions and, and the university let us run wild with giving people access to um, accounts in those days so that we could actually promote the notion of a networked environment for learning and it was really kind of cool and we cost the university like literally multi thousands of dollars a month to do that but we had a wonderful VP academic at uh, at Simon Fraser University who said, that's what we're here for. That's part of our service mission. Just go do it. Don't worry about the cost. And we just kept doing it. And that evolved into the Ministry of Education looking at us and saying, hey, maybe this would work uh, in really remote areas of the province where they've really been poorly served in the past for education and learning resources and the, the real opportunity for kids to graduate, particularly up north along the Alaska Highway from Fort St. John right to the Yukon border. And we set up a project there called New Directions in Distance Learning to really push some boundaries around thinking about learning resources and interactions with teachers and sort of community-based aggregation of learners and learner support. And it was really quite successful. But again, it was really expensive. And in those days, the government of British Columbia was really cool and keen on the notion of doing these experiments, but not so cool and keen on paying for them over the long term. And so that great idea kind of went away. About the same time, the whole learning object idea came around. And so I was highly engaged in that and worked then at the Open Learning Agency, which was a distance education agency in Ontario. And we were part of a huge federal government project called EduSource Canada, which was the first cross Canada collection of learning resources that was starting to be built around a kind of repository network with research components that went with it. And government invested $9 million in that, in that project. It was pretty significant way back in 2001. But it was also a time where I was starting to really see there was just way too much technology involved in this. And what I was seeing that was missing uh, was kind of a soul for this sort of learning environment and the rethinking of resources. Like, where's the soul in this? Like, it, it's one thing to do it technically and make it work. Um, but it was another to actually engage people to think it was interesting, useful, and beneficial to them and building a community around it. And that was really hard. And I couldn't quite figure out what was missing. And I wrote a paper then called Learn Object Lessons from the Web 2001. I just put the link there for it. It's on a Penn State University site right now. And you'll get a sense from the tone of that paper that I was pretty strident in those days. It's like, move. And uh, so it was pretty, pretty uh, questioning of the way our universities were organized, particularly around how they use learning resources. And it wasn't very effective. And interestingly, um, I moved to the private sector for a year in that time period, precisely because the private sector wanted to objectify many of its teaching and learning resources. And in fact, our company was building for mobile phones back in 2001 things we called nanobytes and learning nuggets and stuff we actually marketed to the public, like five things to think about before you go into a negotiation meeting, stuff like that it was actually fairly successful. But 
oh God, I couldn't do that forever. So I moved to, a, <laughs> I moved to the New Media Innovation Center, which was just one building over where I worked. It was a research lab run by our universities in the province and a bunch of big companies like Electronic Arts. And during that time period, I met David Wiley for the first time. It was 2001. And he came to Numic. And I immediately got the idea about where the soul part of this lived. And it was so refreshing that, hey, if you give stuff away, people may like it. And by the way, your reputation may just climb enormously from that process. So meeting David was a seminal moment for me. It was like, I get it. And so it was really interesting. In that time period, I was then part of a consulting group that was ramping up BC campus for government. I was working for the Research Universities Council of British Columbia, and they asked me to do some work on this particular idea that government had for BC campus and it all kind of evolved from there. I ended up becoming the executive director of BC campus in 2003 and hired as two of my first people, Paul Stacy and Scott Leslie. And both those guys were kind of totally vested in the same idea. And it was, why would the crown own copyright for stuff they fund? Why wouldn't we vest it with the creators and ask them for a reuse license back? And so we started playing with some of those ideas in the early days, but we couldn't, like Christina, the resistance, Christina just noted, we were getting all that resistance then. It was like, no, it has to be only used within the boundaries of British Columbia. It's taxpayers' money from British Columbia. And so we wrote a bunch of licenses with Faskin Martino's IP department, big legal firm in Vancouver, uh, called the uh, BC Commons Licenses. And that was probably one of the worst decisions we ever made uh, because we ended up having to kind of wean those back from institutions over time. And thankfully, people like Brian Lamb worked at UBC in those days. And there were people at UBC who really understood what we were trying to do and were some of the early pioneers in this province of actually giving uh, institutional support for an idea of this type. We had an associate vice president on our board of directors at BC campus at the time, and, and she got it. And just through her force of voice, we started to move things forward. Uh, it wasn't until 2006 that we started playing with Creative Commons licenses. And probably one of the best storytelling things I've ever seen happened at Open Ed 2009 in Vancouver, and it was, of course, Cogdog, Alan Levine, did a keynote called Amazing Stories of Openness, in which he had a kind of Hollywood Squares wall o video up on the front of the podium with all of these people like Martin Weller and uh, Audrey Waters and people like that who he could just kind of push a button and they would tell their story. It was fantastic. It's one of the best things I've ever seen. And I always sit, remind Alan that when I see him, it's like, that was the best. We got to do that again sometime. Um, around 2012, we realized after running $8 million of public funding through British Columbia's universities that we were getting uh, lots of material built, but it had no cohesion. And so we really started to think, what would make it happen? And we saw what OpenStax was doing and decided an open textbook program really is what we should focus in. And I was very fortunate to convince the minister of the day that this would be really good public policy if she were to push for it. And so I built her a presentation, which is here at the link I just sent you, which she took to the Council of Ministers of Education Canada in summer 2012 to say, this is where we think we'd like to go in British Columbia. And I thought it was a bold step for her to take that forward. That was the year that the Paris OER Declaration happened, and I was fortunate to be invited uh, to Paris to speak on behalf of Canada in that beautiful big auditorium at UNESCO about what was happening and where we saw things going. I remember the people who were also on the podium, Hal Plotkin, who I now know and lives in California. He was part of the Obama administration's 
pitch on open. And people from the European community who were there from Poland and, and uh, Slovenia, who were kind of moving in this direction at that time. We announced that open textbook program in 2012, and it has taken off since then. Uh, Mary Burgess has done a fantastic job with the BC campus team to move that stuff outward. And we're reaping the benefit of that now in Ontario by migrating that library to Ontario and now seeking to enhance it in a project with Ryerson University, with the Rebus Foundation, to build an open publishing infrastructure for the province of Ontario. That kind of stuff is what we need to do. And then share it back across the country as a kind of a federated model. Uh, I think one of the great things about openness is the sense of community that people get through being a part of it. And for me, that is a really important piece of the puzzle. And I've tried really hard while I was at Simon Fraser University briefly for a year, at ECIT for a year, to kind of ignite that thinking in those two institutions. And I think fairly successfully, so I'm, I'm pleased to have been a part of that. Also pleased to be going to Slovenia in 2017, uh, in September, just got an invitation for the government of Slovenia to come there and be a part of that event. And I think that the open community really has begun to take root. I mean, I can really feel it when I talk to people in Ontario now that they get it. The open ranger community, the Helen DeWards, the Jenny Haymans, the Terry Greens, the people who have got infected by the bug are going out there and talking about it and bringing colleagues and friends along. And it's very much a gifting community, a gift of knowledge, a gift of friendship, a gift of community. It's really good stuff. And so for me, uh, I'm really pleased to be continually a part of this community from all the way back in the learning object days to the finding of soul to go with that and now to see how that's vested itself in our kind of burgeoning community across Canada. And I hope we can continue to support it and make it move forward productively. That's my story. Wow, David, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I forgot to mention early on that I, I am very privileged to be part of David's team at eCampus Ontario right now, uh, and even more privileged to be asked to be leading some of the open uh, OER community building for Ontario at this time. Uh, because as you say, David, and I agree, uh, there's momentum, real, really strong momentum. And I'm feeling that in all of the stories and all of the people that I talked with this week are feeling very engaged. Uh, and I know from time to time in the community, we can start to feel a little bit disengaged and a little frustrated and things like that. But I feel like there's so much positive momentum. Uh, and I just want to add one little thing from Rajiv Jangani was talking about you, David, and we were having a good laugh that uh, he was going to present you as patient zero in the epidemic of open in Canada. <laughs> and hearing your story, <laughs> I can hear exactly why that would be true. Um, and, you know, I learned quite a bit about you that I didn't know, and I'm very pleased to know from hearing your story today, from hearing all the stories. So I want to thank you all very much for sharing your time and graciously sharing your stories. If there are any additional links uh, to the things that you talked about today, please send them to me and I'll make sure I post them with the recording of what we've done today. <laughs> and there's Terry showing off the OEO Rangers badge. Uh, yeah, it's really a wonderful time to be working at eCampus Ontario and working in Canada uh, with such amazing educators as yourselves. <laughs> So I hope everyone has a really great day, and thank you again for your time. I'm going to the beach. Oh, have fun, Terry. <laughs> have lots of fun. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.